What is the hap hap happiest chord trick in the book, and why is it in all of our favorite Christmas songs? Let's talk about that. Well, hey there, Christmas kiddos. It's your good buddy, Uncle Ben. I am myself a bit of a Christmas music junkie, and it seems like about every year around this time, I find myself learning a whole new slew of Christmas tunes to entertain my friends and family and get my ass back on the nice list. So here recently, as I was going through and learning a bunch of Christmas songs from yesteryear and more recent history, I noticed that just about all of them contained the exact same chord cadence in various degrees of harmonic complexity, and it just made me so gosh darn jolly, I knew I had to share it with you guys this Christmas. So on today's lesson, I'm going to show you guys what the super cool secret chord cadence is, give you a little bit of the basic theory and harmony behind it, and talk about why it works the way it does, as well as show you where you have heard this in some of your favorite Krimba songs in increasingly more complex scenarios. And as always, tabs and charts for this lesson are available over on my Instagram page at Ben Eller Guitars. Just search for hashtag WeekendWankShop258, find all the material, and follow along. If you like this lesson and want to say thanks by means of stuffing my stocking with silver and gold, you can do that by supporting my channel over on my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Guitars. But of course, I would be a very naughty uncle if I didn't give you guys something back to say thanks, so that's why over on the Patreon page you can find downloadable charts, tabs, backing tracks, and a slew of bonus lessons. All kinds of good stuff is available to everybody over there, even if you're just at the $1 level. So be sure to click the Patreon link in the video description, check out that page, and start reaping the benefits today. there was a couple of different ways of playing this super cool chord cadence, which is what us nerds would refer to as a 1-6-2-5-1 progression. And it's usually used as a closing phrase or turnaround in a lot of our favorite Christmas songs. But if you don't understand what I mean by 1-6-2-5, here's the fastest music theory lesson I can give you. Just like pretty much everything else in music theory, it all starts with the major scale. I'm going to go with the C scale because it's kind of the easiest one to look at because it's just natural notes. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. If this doesn't make any sense to you, I recommend you check out my This Is Why You Suck At Guitar, You Don't Understand The Major Scale video. It's got everything you need. In a major scale, we have seven notes that all can be turned into chords. You typically see these written out in Roman numeral fashion like this. C is the one, D is the two, and so on. You can take the individual notes of this scale and turn them into chords with a really easy trick. So what happens is that you have a note like your C right here, the note that lives two doors down from it. So your C note and your E note. Now they're happy and they get along great, but just like in a lot of long-term relationships, sometimes they want to bring a third party in to, I don't know, spice things up a little bit. So they invite the note from two doors down over and make a big happy trio. These three notes have the harmonic relationship of being a root note, a major third, and a perfect fifth, which is the formula that always gives us a major chord. So you could say that in the key of C, the one chord, the chord that's being built off the first note, is C major. This leapfrog harmony trick happens with every single note in the scale. So the D hooks up with F and A, the E note would hook up with G and B. Again, you're always just leapfrogging over a note in the middle of them. If we take those single notes and leapfrog them all out into forming basic chord triads, we'd end up with something like this. Our one chord develops as a major, our two and three are both minors, our four chord is major, our five chord is major, our six chord is minor, and the seven chord is a weird old diminished chord. And it works the same way regardless of what major key you're in. So if I'd written out a G scale, for example, you would still have a major chord being formed off of the first note, a minor chord being formed off the second and third, and so on. So when I say something like a one, six, two, five, what I mean is staying in whatever key you're in, like the key of C here, for example, and playing the chord that's formed off of the one, followed by the chord that's formed off of the six, followed by the two, and then the five, and then back to one usually. We can also form even more extended chords by doing that leapfrog game that we talked about, and then getting really freaky and going one more over right here. This gives us our first tier of seven chords, or jazz chords, as you might have heard them called. If you do that with all those notes, that's how you end up getting chords like C major seven, 
E minor seven and stuff like that. But the one that I really want to focus on is what happens here on the five chord with the G. So the usual game of leapfrog from G will give us G, B, and D. But then if we go super crazy and play leapfrog again from D, you get this F note right there. Now again, this gives us a very special chord here because that spells out root, major third, fifth, and then this note is a flat seven. This gives us something that we call a dominant chord, sometimes called a dominant seven or just plain seven chord. That's not the same thing as major seven. A major seven chord has a regular seven in it. A dominant seven chord is like a major chord with that freaky flat seven in it. And dominant chords are the key to understanding the magic that makes this stuff happen. Right there is the first example that I want to talk about that uses this magical 16251 chord progression. That's a little excerpt from the intro or verse section to Sleigh Bells by the Ronettes, which is a song that was on the Phil Spector Christmas album that came out like a million years ago. And if you don't know who Phil Spector is, he's definitely on the naughty list. This chord progression is a perfect example of what I was talking about. It starts off on the one chord, C major. It goes to the chord that's formed off of the 6, A minor. It goes to the chord next that's formed off of the 2, D minor. And then it goes to the 5 chord in its extended dominant form, the G7 chord. C major, A minor, D minor, G7. Now the magic of dominant chords is that they are what I would like to refer to as setup chords. Whenever we play a dominant chord in most songs, we're setting up what's about to happen next. And the way a dominant chord almost always resolves, and I'm not gonna say always because only a Sith deals in absolutes, is with a concept that I like to call the fourth fall. This fourth fall concept is really easy to understand, especially if you just look down at the fretboard of your instrument and watch what's happening with the bass notes. So in that song, we had a dominant chord happening right here on G, right? Now, almost all the time, whenever you hear a dominant chord happening, your ears want it to resolve to a chord whose bass note is right here. So just the next string down, same fret if you want to look at it that way. If you have a dominant chord happening here, odds are it's going to be moving to here for the next chord. So you can see in that particular example how your dominant chord on G led you all the way back around to home bass, the one chord, C major. If I had a dominant chord happening right here on B, odds are some kind of E is next. The reason I call that a fourth fall is because this distance between those two bass notes from here to here is musically what we call a fourth. It's the distance from the first note to the fourth note of a scale. One, two, three, four. And that's why I call it the fourth fall is because dominant chords tend to just love to fall through the strings like that. Let me give you another visual example here because some of our dominant chords through this example are gonna be landing on the A string. So for example, if I had a, uh, a D7 chord right here, again, if you look at the bass note of that, the next chord that's gonna follow is probably going to be here. That's a G note. Now that chord doesn't have to be rooted off of that G, it can be rooted off of any G. Like for example, your low G right here, okay? So I don't want you thinking that you literally have to make the bass note on the next string just take that note, move it down, make that a major chord or whatever, and there's that satisfying dominant to one resolution. Now here's a really cool thing about that fourth fall dominant setup to resolution kind of thing. A dominant chord loves to resolve to a major, but it also sounds supremely satisfying to have a dominant resolve to a minor chord. Again, a dominant just wants to go here. It doesn't matter if it's major or minor. Either way, we love that sound. Now, I want to point out that that dominant chord is kind of a sliding door that can either open up to a major chord a fourth away or a minor chord a fourth away because it's going to help you understand what's going on in the next couple of one, six, two, five, one progressions that we're going to talk about that are going to get a little bit more complicated. That is the turnaround from the end of the chorus of it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Thing that'll make them ring is the carol that you sing right within your heart. 
that's a really cool one that shows you how you can take this basic 16251 idea and dress it up a little bit by adding in some more dominant chords into this to help with the fourth fall action. I love the move that this starts off with here. It's in the key of E flat, and it starts off on the four chord here, which is A flat. Then you got this cool A full diminished chord. It's like a diminished seven chord on the flat fifth of the key. I'm telling you, a lot of these old school Christmas songs have more diminished chords than like an Ecrophagist album. It's crazy. So you got four chord, which is major, this sneaky little diminished chord here on the flat five, and then check this move out. You go to the one, E flat. Next we go to the six. Again, this is the start of a one, six, two, five. We go from the one chord to the six. Now the six in this key should be C minor, but it's gonna be C seven instead. It gives your ears a nice little twist right there. And again, why do we play dominant chords, right? To set up a fourth fall. So it's pretty much guaranteeing that by putting this C7 chord right here, even though it's using notes that are way out of key for E flat, we're gonna be basically using this to set up what's happening a fourth away from it, which is your two chord, that F minor. So you use something weird to set up something normal. Again, if that would have gone anywhere else in the key, it wouldn't really have worked. A dominant chord loves to go a fourth away. That goes to your five chord here, B flat seven, which again sets up another fourth fall through a turn to E flat major. That exact same set of chord moves of going from the one chord to a dominant on the six, which sets up the two chord, which goes to a dominant on the five, which sets up the one, can be found in the old school Hawaiian classic Melikaliki Maka, which is a Christmas song that makes me think about warm tropical climates. Again, pardon the garbage singing here, but this comes up at the end of the chorus. This is in the key of D, and this is a section where they sing Melikaliki Maka is the wise way to say Merry Christmas to you. Again, that's in the key of D, and you can see how it's using the one chord, D major. Going to the six as a dominant, again, this should be B minor, but he's playing B7 instead to set up. Something happening a fourth away, your two chord, E minor. Then your five chord, A7, which sets up the next chord, back to the one, D major. That song is also covered in several other instances of dominant chords being used in the, quote, wrong spot to set up harmonic resolution that happens a fourth away. Like halfway through the verse is that part that goes, here we know that Christmas will be green and bright, right? That was a dominant chord on the one, on D. But again, by playing D7, you're setting up G, the four chord. After this, it goes to B7 again. Again, what do you think that's for? It's to set up something happening here on E next, which in this case is a dominant. Again, it's not supposed to go there, that's a two position, but it sets up something that happens here on A, which is the actual real dominant chord, right? A7, which takes you all the way back to one. Again, that was a weird one. Dominant chord here sets up this. Dominant chord here sets up this, which that's a dominant chord, so it set up that, which is a dominant chord, so it set up that. Again, this is really cool, complicated chord stuff going on in these tunes. They just seem like innocent little Christmas songs, and they are, but they're taking a lot from the jazz vocabulary that was a regular part of pop music in this time. Now that series of dominant chords that we saw in that turnaround where we had a dominant on the six, which led to a dominant on the two, which led to a dominant on the five, again, just falling. Dominant here leads to dominant here, leads to dominant here, leads to here, in this case, resolution on the one chord. That's something that has been a jazz tradition for like a billion years. A lot of times people call those rhythm changes, going back to the old school jazz standard, I've Got Rhythm. Again, that's a really old school, super common move that's been around since the days that little baby Jesus was riding around on a dinosaur. The sound of those dominant chords with the root notes falling in fourths is just about one of the happiest sounds imaginable. And there's no better place to hear it than in the classic tune, Have a Holly Jolly Christmas by Burl and Ives. Now this song is in the key of C, and there towards the end of the chorus, it goes to that part that says, oh by golly, have a holly jolly Christmas this year. It starts us off here on the five chord on G. Again, one, two, three, four, five. Turn that into a chord, you get a G. 
Now check out what happens here. That's almost happy enough to make me forget all about the time that my dad got me a carton of smokes for Christmas. And they were menthols. What's up with that? All smoking is bad. Do not smoke. Do not. Okay, so with that progression there, I had C, the 1, going to a dominant chord on the 6, A7, which led to a dominant chord on the 2, D7, which led to a dominant chord on the 5, G7, which returned us back to C. Now this chain of fourth falls is really easy to see, especially if you put the bass notes right here going through the bottom strings. So we started off in C, then we put a dominant chord right here on A. Because it's dominant, it led you around to right here, D. You made that a dominant chord, that's going to lead you here, to G. You made that a dominant chord, so it's going to lead you here, to C. Again, really try to soak that in. If you put a dominant chord here, it's usually going to lead to something happening here. If that's also a dominant chord, it's going to lead you here. If that's also a dominant chord, it's going to lead you here. I used to have a really hard time understanding stuff like this because I thought that you could just make chords that were in key and you always had to color inside of the lines, you know? But ultimately, at the end of the day, harmony is a lot more flexible than I think a lot of guitar players think it is. Again, stick a dominant chord pretty much anywhere as long as you go here next it's probably fine. So as we've gone through this lesson, we've seen the one, six, two, five, one progression. Start off with Humble Roots in that Ronette song, which is all diatonic. Getting a little bit more complex by making that six chord a dominant like we did in It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas. Even more complex by making that two dominant as well, like we saw in Holly Jolly Christmas. And now I want to give you guys an example of this same idea, but taken into an even more complex form in the immortal Christmas classic by Mimi herself. All I want for Christmas is you by Mariah Carey. Make my wish come true. All I want for Christmas. Excuse me. Oh, 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 is you. Nailed it. Okay, so again, this is a 1, 6, 2, 5, 1 in the key of G, but they're making it even more complicated with the use of what we call alterations. So it starts off here on G, the 1 chord, and then like the others, it's going to go to the 6 chord as a dominant, which would mean an E7 chord. But unlike the other examples, this isn't just an E7. This is an E7 flat 9 chord. Now that is a spicy Christmas Amita ball. Basically, in a nutshell, dominant chords provide the tension that you want to hear resolve back to the 1 chord, again with that 4th fall kind of action. But we can make those dominant chords sound even more tense and our ear wants them to resolve even more by making what we call alterations to them. And these alterations are the ugliest notes in the known universe, so it's really uncomfortable just to sit on top of them for a while. You want to hear that dominant chord move back to home base even more whenever we use them instead of just a regular dominant chord. Now that all might sound really complicated, but if you know the Jimi Hendrix chord, the Purple Haze verse chord, you already know an altered chord. Altered chords happen whenever we start off with a dominant chord, and then we add in any or all of these notes. The flat nine, the sharp nine, the flat five, or the sharp five. Again, here's G7 to C. Here's G7 sharp five to C. Hear how that note, that E flat note in there? You just really want to hear that pull up to become the E note that's in the C chord. You're a train, we get it. I'm a train. Here's a G7 with a flat five. It's a D flat note. And listen how that resolves to the C note that's in the one chord even better. So in the All I Want For Christmas Is You turn around, what we got here is the one chord, G, going to the six chord here, which we're gonna play as a dominant, with a flat nine interval. So this is E7 flat nine. Now again, this makes us really want to hear that resolution a fourth away to A minor 7, the 2 chord. And then we're going to go here to the 5, the D7, but it's not just D7. It's D7 flat 9. 
in just like the same shape you used up here, which makes that return to G even more satisfying. So if you plan these moves out, not only can you insert dominant chords in seemingly random places, you can make them sound even more hip and tense by making them alter dominant chords on top of it. Also, the use of those altered chords creates really beautiful chromatic lines that you can hear in here too. Check this out. So there's your G. Now check this out. E7 with the flat 9. There's an F note. A minor 7. There's an E note. D7 flat 9. E flat note. Going back to the D note that's in the G chord. So throughout that progression, you heard happen. Those chromatic lines are not available if you're just staying completely in key and playing diatonic. These altered chords open up all kinds of super hip chromatic pathways through the coolest chord progressions. Now, if you want to hear all of those tricks on display, as well as a bunch of other really neat things, you should check out the tune, Please Come Home for Christmas. Honestly, I should probably just do like an entire breakdown of all the cool chord stuff happening in that song. It's got all those dominance falling in fourths like we talked about in really rapid succession. It's got a really quick six, two, five, back to the one thing in there where like they're all dominance. It's also got a bunch of diminished chords, augmented chords, really expensive stuff on display, and a bitchin' guitar solo, no matter which version you listen to. Try prowling through some of your favorite Christmas songs and see where you find this 6251 turnaround happening inside of them. I bet it's in a lot more tunes than you think. I also managed to find it in Baby It's Cold Outside, uh, Please Christmas Don't Be Late by the Chipmunks. Tons of tunes use this trick, again, in varying degrees of complexity as we saw in this video. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for new content coming at you every single week. Ring the bell for notifications every time I drop a new slice of fried gold right here on the channel. And don't forget, if you learned something from this video and want to say thanks and support my channel, be sure to head over to that Patreon page at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Well guys, it's been a ton of fun, but it's about time for me to get away from the camera and go feed the reindeer. And as for you, I recommend that you get away from the computer and go play some guitar. Less clicking, more picking. Merry Christmas.